In the headlines on this very busy news day, the former Shah of Iran has left this country, but the Muslim students who hold our embassy in Tehran say they'll still keep the hostages. Four people are dead after a hot air balloon exploded in Broward County this morning, and some City of Miami workers get a nice pre-holiday surprise. Those stories and a whole lot more are coming your way next on the 10 o'clock news. This is a consumer tip from Channel 6 Call for Action. We have the following suggestions for you. If your car needs major repairs, Get more than one opinion for both the need and the price. Be sure that the estimates are written and signed. Insist on the return of replaced parts. Know your mechanic. After you have obtained a written estimate, insist that any additional repairs be made only after authorization. Understand in advance and obtain in writing all guarantees and warranties. If you think you've been victimized, Call for Action advises you to report the problem to your district attorney as soon as possible. If you want us to help you, please call us in Dade at area code 305-371-6566 any weekday between 11 and 1. That's Call for Action, where one of our trained volunteers is waiting for your call. In the summer, water acts like a magnet for people and for lightning, too. On, in, or near the water, you are in danger when a thunderstorm approaches. Get away from the water and under cover before the storm moves in. A lightning safety message. From the Channel 6 Satellite News Center, this is the 10 o'clock news with comprehensive South Florida reports, plus news via satellite from across the nation and around the world. Good evening, I'm Nick Bogert. There are a couple of developments in tonight's news that may help bring about an end to the hostage situation in Tehran. The big story, the former Shah of Iran left the U.S. today. He's going to live in Panama. Chris Lorenzo has more by satellite from Washington. For White House Staff Chief Ham Jordan, it was shuttle diplomacy at its best. For the past week, he has been flying between Washington, Texas, and Panama. In Panama, he wanted to be sure the former Shah of Iran was still welcome. He was. In Texas, he wanted to see if the Shah was willing to go. After Jordan and the Shah's personal representatives inspected the facilities in Panama and approved, the Shah gave his final assent on Friday. This morning, after his doctor said he could travel, the Shah left Texas for Panama. The president called him to say goodbye, and then he called Panama. President Carter has expressed to President Royo the appreciation of the American people for the humanitarian and statesmanlike attitude of the government of Panama. White House officials insist there were no deals made with Panama. Meanwhile, the International Court of Justice in The Hague condemned Iran for taking the hostages in violation of international law. In sum, the order says, let the hostages go in peace, let them go now. Senior White House officials say they hope these two moves will force Iran to release the hostages. They point out the U.S. never intended to hand over the Shah and that now it cannot. So, they say, the question of the Shah is no longer an obstacle. Secretary of State Vance says he expects the hostages to be released immediately. And one senior White House official said that if Iran does not release the hostages, then the U.S. will continue with its other options, economic, political, and possibly military. The so-called tightening of the screws will continue relentlessly until the hostages are free and we can light our national Christmas tree. From the White House, this is Chris Lorenzo reporting for the 10 o'clock news. Preliminary reaction from Tehran, anger. The students who have held 50 Americans prisoners in the embassy there were not pleased, and they said the Shah's departure from the U.S. will definitely mean trials for some of their captives on espionage charges. So far, no reaction at all from the Ayatollah Khomeini. America's second senior envoy at the U.N., meanwhile, reacted to today's events by saying the next couple of days will be critical. The next 48 hours are going to be very important. It's a very risky time, a very dangerous time. The departure of the Shah has created a new, new uh, position 
I think it's a very constructive departure, certainly under his own uh, decision. He's not forced out of the country, but it certainly changes the situation. What the reaction in Tehran is going to be is unpredictable, as is everything else in Tehran. We believe, I certainly believe, that they will not do anything to harm the hostages because to do so would bring the full weight of world opinion down on Iran and would cause the United States to respond in a way that Iran could not afford. Well, commentator Daniel Shore agrees with Vanden Heuvel that today's events mark a turning point, and he says that decision makers at the White House are thinking that way too. It wasn't planned that the Shah's departure should coincide with a world court order for release of the hostages, but together these two developments mean that for the Carter administration, six weeks of waiting are over, and the time has come to force a resolution of this crisis. If Iran does not obey the court's order, there is no intention of waiting for the UN Security Council to enforce sanctions. It's been made clear here today that the U.S. is ready to act on its own through economic sanctions and possibly in more forceful ways. In nudging the Shah to go to Panama, the Carter administration proceeds on the assumption that this will ease the tension and make it easier for the Iranians to free the hostages. Iranian militants have been saying the Shah's departure for anywhere except Iran would only make things worse, but those statements have not been repeated lately. When Chargé d'Affaires Bruce Langan told the Iranians today the Shah was leaving, it was with an air of, it is all up to you now. The Carter administration is waiting for the Iranians to move, and the word here is that it won't wait very long. This is Daniel Shore at the White House. In other news, after 11 years in force, American trade sanctions against Rhodesia will end as of today. The Cuban-Americans aboard turned away without picking up the relatives they'd come for. The Cuban government apparently refused to load that boat because of pressure the U.S. applied through Panama's government. The record 6,000 Cubans who arrived in Key West yesterday, today, smashed records at the Processing Center in Miami. Marianne Murciano has details. By 10 this Key West, those in Opalaca Airport, and those already spread out in the community. Marianne Murciano for the Channel 6, 10 o'clock news. Lots of local congressmen went to the White House today for briefings on administration plans for the Cuban refugees. They left apparently confident that changes in U.S. refugee laws would be considered and that federal help for this area would be forthcoming. And the most pressed like our answers. Along with Congressman Pepper and Fassell, Florida Senator Dick Stone got a White House briefing today. Stone came away saying the president will be taking steps to deport hardened criminals who came in the refugee boat lift. About 400 Cubans who have been classified as criminals are being housed in an Alabama prison. Stone hopes that deportation efforts will have an effect on refugee camps, particularly Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, where refugees rioted last weekend. But Fort Chaffee's all quiet now, as Steve Narissi reports via satellite. State police and National Guardsmen are still because of the riots and violence Sunday night. Resettling them could become somewhat of a problem. Congressman Earl Hutto of Panama City quotes State Department officials as saying the relocation center at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida may be phased out soon, perhaps within 10 days. That would doubtless mean extra burdens for Wisconsin's Fort McCoy. More on Fort McCoy when the 10 o'clock news continues. Phase. Call us toll free for reservations. Officials at other refugee relocation centers say they're learning from last weekend's riots at Fort Chaffee. Up in western Wisconsin, there is confidence that Fort McCoy won't have such problems, as Hank Plant reports. The Cuban influx into Foy, Wisconsin, this is Hank Plant. Dade County School Board today announced that thousands of recently arrived refugees will have the chance to learn English in summer school programs beginning July 1st. Marianne Murciano has details. So far, more than eight Anna for the Channel 6, 10 o'clock news. Former Metro Commissioner Neil Adams pleaded no contest today to charges he tried to carry a concealed weapon into Miami's federal courthouse last December. Adams' lawyer claimed his client had forgotten he had a gun on him. Adams was given a sentence of 30 days probation. Police have identified the two persons shot to death uh, yesterday in a luxury suite at Coral Gables' David William Hotel. They are 25-year-old Mitchell Angel Sierra, also known as Jose Hernandez, and 24-year-old Mercedes Sierra. Police identified the infant found with them as Mitchell A. Sierra Jr. He's in good condition. According to police, who say a grocery bag in the suite contained about $50,000, the killings were drug-related. <laughs> Iran 
Chairman's Ayatollah Khomeini spoke today to delegates at what's billed as a Crimes of America conference. He says President Carter is afraid of that meeting because it will prove U.S. wrongdoing in Iran. Liz Aitken has this satellite report. Delegates to the conference started their civilization reporting. Two gunmen, apparently Iranians, walked into the Iraqi embassy in Rome, Italy today, shouting, Viva Khomeini! Then they opened fire on the embassy staff, killing one person and wounding another. Chris Hardy has this satellite report. Two armed men burst. This is Chris Hardy reporting. Two Palestinian mayors who were expelled last month from the West Bank began a two-week tour of the United States today. They denounced Israeli policy and called Menachem Begin the worst terrorist in the history of the world. Patricia Sagan reports. This is Mayor Mohammed Milham. Patricia Sagan at the State Department. Sources in Kabul say Afghanistan's army has been hit hard by desertions and Civil War casualties, so much so that the Soviet-backed government there has launched a conscription drive. There's a car in North Miami that stops folks dead in their tracks. They just stare at it as it goes by. The man who drives it hopes the car will help him make a point about energy preparedness. He'll take it to Washington, where he talks with energy officials next week. Here's Nick Bogert's report. The limousine's an eye-opener anyway, but the trailer on the back is what really sets it apart. It's a gas generator, and retired automotive engineer Harry LaFontaine fuels it with wood, waste wood from a furniture company. Once the hearth on the trailer is lit, it extracts gas from the wood at temperatures of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That gas, when mixed with air in his slightly modified carburetor, makes LaFontaine's limo go. You lose around 25% in the actual BTU output. And of course, there's an added weight of the generator to it. Otherwise, it's very much the same. Uh, why do you get except 25% power loss? Gasification of wood, coal, or garbage is most likely in the future for industrial purposes. Harry LaFontaine agrees that for now his car is just a curiosity. I really feel that this is something you use when everything else goes wrong. It's something you have as an emergency solution if uh, somebody cut off our oil supply. But LaFontaine wants people to know more about gasification to open up long expired patents to the tinkerers of America. That knowledge will be needed, he says, should war or disaster interrupt oil supplies. World War II first exposed LaFontaine to gasification technology. Three million vehicles were converted in Europe when gas supplies went to the front. LaFontaine will take his big white car to Washington next week, hoping to get government backing for the effort to spread around the knowledge about gasification. Nick Bogert for the Channel 6, 10 o'clock news. I wonder if all the rain... The Carter administration today unveiled its immediate response to last month's riots here in Miami. The package totals about $71 million, most of it in loans to small businesses and other economic boosts for riot-stricken areas. Nick Bogart has more on that story. Just rebuilding the areas hit by the May violence would cost at least $100 million, according to a recent county estimate. Federal officials say the grants and loans outlined today will help in that rebuilding, but more importantly, will begin the building of a new economic base for Liberty City and other riot-torn neighborhoods. But White House aide Eugene Eidenberg stresses that this package alone can't do the job. This investment of 70-plus million dollars will not produce the permanent and constructive changes that are needed if the state and local governments and the private sector do not come in behind this investment in a very strong and sustained way. This is no short-term project. Most of the $71 million package is in the form of low-interest loans for businesses damaged or destroyed by the riots, $40 million in loans said to be near congressional approval. There's almost four and a third million dollars for Labor Department jobs programs, money for a thousand summer jobs available immediately, long-term training money to start in October. $5 million in Commerce Department money for economic development. Leverage said Eidenberg for private money, perhaps another $10 million. Eidenberg also said the timetable for federal dollars already destined for South Florida will be moved up. $17 million for mass transit projects and one and a third million for security in public housing projects. No new federal bureaucracy will be created. Michael Wallach, a local so. Commerce Department official, will oversee distribution of the money. Metro Mayor Steve Clark called it a great first step. And Assistant County Manager Dewey Knight also seemed pleased. The federal government has clearly uh, demonstrated that they are ready to uh, take some steps, and we've got to uh, follow through and do exactly the same thing. 
Federal officials pledged further help later for riot-torn areas. Eidenberg could not say what form future efforts might take, but he did say, we will not walk away from this community. Nick Bogert for the Channel 6, 10 o'clock news. A local black leaders who heard today's announcements... This morning, the shell of the Family Health Center was still standing, but its insides were burned out. The center was broken into about 1 a.m. Microphones are part of the alarm system in the building, so several blocks away, security personnel were monitoring events. This is how the actual break-in sounded. The tape goes on for about three hours. The microphones were not destroyed until about 4 a.m. Firemen, with a police escort, didn't arrive until after 7. Health Center Director Jesse Trice says area residents can go to another family health center on 27th Avenue, that free transportation will be provided. Rachel Smith wanted to take her baby to the doctor today. It don't make no sense because, hey, we got to live around here. We got to go to the clinic. We got kids need to be having, you know, shots at school and stuff. And it's not right. They're knocking our own thing for these little poor black kids, you know, trying to get an education. It don't make no sense. Next door, the rental offices and maintenance buildings for the Scott projects had also been hit. Windows were broken, small fires set, and there were lots of signs of vandalism and looting. We had quite a bit of uh, equipment taken, all our heavy duty equipment, plumbing equipment. We can't rent any kind of service to the residents now because they've stolen everything we had to work with. Some people on the street here say the crowd initially was not interested in damaging the community buildings. The original plan, these people say, was to loot a train that was to come across these tracks that cross 22nd Avenue. But the engineers saw a dumpster which had been dragged onto the tracks as part of that plan and backed his train away. So the crowd shifted its attention to the health center and Scott Project buildings instead, leaving some local residents angry this morning about their loss of services. Last night's disturbances were largely centered in the James Scott Housing Project, a mass of subsidized housing along 22nd Avenue. And today, county officials said there had been some changes soon at the Scott Project. Nick Bogart has that story. In the photos taken by the Public Housing Authority, James Scott does not look too bad. The two-story buildings, which hold in all 858 apartments, are neat, if not grand. The reality is harsher. One black leader estimates there are about 100 more families than apartments in the Scott Projects, and also guesses that unemployment among Scott residents runs to perhaps 50 percent. Dade Housing Director Melvin Adams says his people will try to put smaller families into Scott in coming months. The population's just too young right now. There are a high percentage of welfare families, uh, single parent families, and when there's a lot of kids and only one parent, uh, the kids aren't as well controlled as, uh, as they might be. Housing officials will review the leases of families who have shown what Adams calls antisocial behavior. Adams says if such behavior can be proved, troublemakers will be kicked out of the projects. And housing authorities will meet with police soon to talk about ways of changing Scott's physical setup so it provides fewer hiding places for criminals. Are these changes prompted by what happened last night? We've been talking about this for some time. I, I'd have to be honest and say we would not be initiating it today were it not for last night. I think, however, within the next month or two, we would have initiated it. But this last night certainly speeded it up. But Adams admits the changes to come will be relatively small, that there's little that he can do to address the deeper frustrations that are part of the Scott Projects. Nick Bogert for the Channel 6, 10 o'clock news. Well, the violence in Liberty City yesterday began well before dark and ended, for the most part, by the time we signed off the 10 o'clock news last evening. But uh, some areas remained tense well into the morning's early hours. Nick Bogart was at one of those spots, and here's his report. What you are seeing is a Gulf gasoline station burning at about a quarter to 11 last night. You cannot see the crowd, estimated at between 200 and 500, which set it afire using gas from its own pumps. About 35 police officers stood four blocks away with lots of reporters and photographers and made no move toward the fire or the crowd. That kind of containment policy won the compliments of Dr. Preston Marshall, a community relations board member who had been out on the street corners last night. He thought police response was good because of lessons learned during the May violence. I think that they perhaps...